Robert Riley, the director of the Westminster Institute, and I would like to welcome you to our program today on the consequences of the strategic failure in Afghanistan. I'm joined by three distinguished guests for presentation and discussion amongst them. The first is Ambassador Ali Jalali, who served as Afghanistan's Interior Ministry from 2003 to 2005, overseeing the creation of a trained force of 50,000 Afghan National Police and 12,000 Border Police to work effectively in counter narcotics, counter terrorism, and criminal investigation. He also serves, served as Afghan ambassador to Germany and designated special envoy to NATO. He is a professor at the Near East South Asia Center for Strategic Studies at the National Defense University in Washington, DC. His most recent book is A Military History of Afghanistan from the Great Game to the Global War on Terror. A former official in the Afghan army, Colonel Jalali, served as a top military planner with the Afghan resistance, the Mujahideen, following the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. Dr. Patrick Sukdeo is the founder and chairman of the Westminster Institute. He has served as advisor to permanent joint headquarters, uh, United Kingdom and as cultural advisor to Regional Command South Afghanistan and to ISAF, the International Security Assistance Force in Kabul, Afghanistan. Dr. Sukdeo has been a visiting senior fellow at the Defense Academy in the UK and a fellow of the Security Institute also in the UK. He received his PhD from London University School of Oriental and African Studies. He is the author of more than 20 books, including Unmasking Islamic State and Understanding Islamist Terrorism. Dr. Hai Rothstein recently was a longtime faculty member at the Naval Postgraduate School in Monterey, California. He spent considerable time in Afghanistan and is the author of Afghanistan and the Troubled Future of Unconventional Warfare. He also contributed to and edited Afghan Endgame's Strategy and Policy Choices for America's Longest War. Dr. Rothstein served in the US Army as a Special Forces Officer for more than 26 years. He is a graduate of the West Point Military Academy. Gentlemen, thank you for joining me today to discuss the strategic consequences of the failure in Afghanistan. Ambassador Jalali, please begin. Thank you very much and uh, the peace to be here. And I appreciate uh, giving me this invitation to share with you my thoughts, uh, mostly about the situation, uh, the current uh, uh, situation in Afghanistan and the dramatic changes that uh, are taking place there. Well, uh, I'm sure that uh, all of you uh, follow the uh, media, the news uh, about the situation in Afghanistan in the, uh, the crisis there, in the sudden change of everything in, the, in that country, the sudden uh, you know, uh, takeover of the Taliban of the Afghan capital, the, the, the uh, collapse of the Afghan government, they all came at the same time. Uh, in the last weeks of the United States withdrawal from Afghanistan, which by itself created a major uh, problem and major chaos in, in Afghanistan that you can see on the uh, media and uh, on the uh, TV screens. And the, the um, optics is uh, not very good. The optics are very disappointing. One question is that uh, how, uh, why the Afghan national security forces crumbled so quickly uh, you know, in the face of the advancing Taliban and how the Afghan government was collapsed so quickly. Well, it was quick, it wasn't surprising, but at the same time, one has to go back to uh, several months, it's maybe a, a year and a half back, to see that the a process was set in motion in uh, 2020 on 29th of uh, February in uh, uh, Doha, when the United States uh, signed a green, uh, peace agreement with the Taliban, giving them some concessions 
in pledging that the, the uh, US forces will leave Afghanistan in 14 months with uh, a major part of it leaving in four months. Uh, in return, the, the Taliban uh, pledged that they will severe ties with the Al Qaeda and other extremist groups and will uh, not allow these groups to attack, to use Afghanistan's soil against uh, the United States interest and other and allies, and will enter uh, the uh, negoti peace negotiation with the Afghan government uh, in order to reach a settlement, political settlement to end the war. Well, these were uh, the, uh, the agreement actually gave the Taliban an opportunity to wait out the uh, withdrawal of the uh, US forces. The, uh, the process that, that, that was expected to take place was uh, very difficult to control, very concrete and force. For the US, it was very clear cut. They would withdraw forces on the, and on the calendar base. The date was there. For the Taliban, they could take time. There was no, they did uh, their negotiation with the Kabul government and their uh, the, uh, uh, pledge to severe ties with the Al-Qaeda Al Al were not timelined, were not benchmarked. So they, they can use that. When the U.S. says that uh, if, if the United States is leaving in 14 months, they just uh, try to run the clock. They actually, showed that they are serious to talk with the Afghan government, but you come uh, one excuse after another to delay this. In fact, they were running the clock and they believe that with the withdrawal of the US forces, they will have a better. On the other hand, they pledge that they will not attack US forces in this 14 months, but they continue the violence. They were killing Afghans, not the Americans. So by, by continuing this violence with the reduced U.S. support of the Afghan security forces, it meant that they will have major military uh, gains, which will enable them to win either a military victory or a peace deal on their own terms. That was going on for that time. The, 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 uh, the, the, the ties with the, uh, the Al Qaeda and other extremist groups did not take place, according to UN and others. They never set to discuss seriously the peace with the Afghan government. They continue their violence. So it means that gradually the Afghan security forces lost them. Some people said the Afghan security forces did not uh, fight. They fought very well. They fought very hard. In the past five years, 45,000 Afghan soldiers and uh, police were killed in these fightings. Uh, 40,000 civilians were killed or injured. And uh, why the Afghan government security forces were dependent on support from outside, the Taliban continued to enjoy support from Pakistan, their safe havens in material support. There was no asymmetry that the Afghan government with the redu reduction of the US forces from Afghanistan, there'll be also a reduction of support from Pakistan to the Taliban. That was a one-way support, the one-way deal. No asymmetry, it was a, this was, uh, 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 this should have been a ne uh, negative, a symmetry, but it didn't take place. So gradually in the, in the one year, uh, year and a half, the Taliban were gaining and the Afghan security forces were losing, particularly when the Air Force of Afghan uh, was uh, dependent on outside contractor, foreign contractors for technical support. With uh, that 18,000 contractor were supporting the Afghan Air Force. The main instrument of the of the uh, fighting terrorism and uh, insurgency in Afghanistan, but with withdrawal of these uh, contractors, the air force actually uh, it, uh, efficiency and the capability was gradually degraded. Today, if you're looking at the Afghan uh, you know uh, air force, 
most of the attack air, uh, the, 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 the aircraft and also the, uh, the uh, helicopters were 100% supported and maintained by contractors, outside contractors. With their departure, the Air Force lost its point. On the other hand, Afghan security forces were, were poorly led by the government itself. It was the, the political interference, lack of co-coordination, and uh, lack of logistic support and supply actually gradually degraded the defense level. So when the, the, the other date, the, the, the uh, 14th of April, when Washington announced that the uh, US forces will, will leave by 11th September and later the end of August, this gave them the, the, the Taliban another opportunity. They thought that while the US is packing up, this is the best time to, uh, uh, to uh, escalate their violence, and they did. In the, on the one way that the Taliban are an offensive force, where the, uh, the Afghanistan security forces is a defensive for defending the districts, defending the cities, defending, but the Taliban don't do, they, they, they actually concentrated against these targets consequentially, one by one, and they destroyed. And finally, with the withdrawal, I think they demoralized the, the uh, Afghan security forces, impeded the uh, supply of uh, far-flung you know, uh, security posts. Uh, in many cases, some uh, some uh, security force, uh, security outposts in areas uh, ran out of bullets, out of food, out of uh, out of gas, and therefore then comes something a traditional. Uh, mechanism in Afghan society. That's the conflict resolution, traditional conflict resolution. The tribal leaders and community leaders you know, intervened. And when they saw the situation such that Afghan security forces are isolated, they cannot get the supplies. The, uh, the uh, United States and NATO, who actually they were dependent on, are leaving. So they made a, a local deals. That's always something in, in the history of Afghanistan, making leagues. Most of these areas, district centers and the provincial center uh, fell to the Taliban through local deals. The, the many, many uh, troops saw it very infutile to, to, to continue the fight without any kind of a support. But they, with, the, with the fall of these uh, supports, then Taliban took over. Now, what is going to happen? Taliban and their public statements are saying the right things. It shows that they are, uh, they are changed from the 1990s. They want an inclusive government. They want to respect the uh, human rights norms. They want to protect the rights of women. They want the, uh, the people to have a chance, the women to work, when to go to school, and uh, to be a free media, all these things. Whether they are saying this in order to win international support and recognition, or they, are, they have really changed. Maybe a young generation who were exposed to some uh, new uh, experiences are, are changed, but their ideology has not changed. So we'll have to see, wait and see what is going to happen. I think the, uh, there might be change. They say openly that their ideology is the same, but is an implementation would be different. That's why people are uncertain. People, the mood in Kabul and other cities are now one of shock, uh, fear, anxiety, and, and, and maybe some uh, rays of hope, what will happen. So only a few, days, uh, a few weeks will, will, will tell us what's going to happen. The leadership of Taliban are back in country in Kandahar and they are going to go to Kabul to discuss with the former, uh, with the other uh, politician of Afghanistan, including former president uh, Karzai and uh, Dr. Abdullah, who is the uh, uh, chairman of the uh, National uh, uh, Council of Reconciliation and uh, uh, Mr. Hikmatyar to discuss the, the, the structure of the new government. That is, people hope that this will take place soon. Otherwise, 
they are now suffering in their day-to-day -day lives. The banks are closed, they cannot draw money. The, the prices uh, of uh, the commodities are going up. The uh, exchange rate is going up. The, at the same time, the, uh, the uh, security, the Taliban freed all prisoners in all these provinces, thousands thousands of them, maybe 10,000 of them. Many of them were uh, Al-Qaeda terrorists who were, who were incarcerated by the old government. Some of them are criminals. Today, there are many reports of, of criminality in some, uh, some cities. Despite the fact that Taliban so far, their fighters showed some kind of a discipline. They are uh, not involved in uh, illegal uh, uh, you know, activities, no, 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 no looting, uh, no uh, misbehaving. They are treating the citizens well now, but the uh, situation can change. When, when the, uh, these, all these uh, freed criminals and terrorists come back and then uh, the, in, in Afghanistan uh, in the past two months, 10,000 foreign jihadists came to Afghanistan. And they are, some of the jihadists who were freed from Kabul were, were, uh, uh, were received with uh, open arms by the people in, in, uh, in uh, Pakistan we went to Pakistan now and God landed. So we don't see what is going to happen. We don't know what would going to happen. Now it is the, everything is, is uh, very uncertain. And I hope that the, that the Taliban will uh, uh, make good on their promises to, to agree with an inclusive government, protect the uh, civil liberties and the women's rights. And also more important, they will not allow these jihadists, foreign jihadists, to get a footprint again and, and foothold again in Afghanistan and use the Afghan soil for their, uh, the, uh, for their uh, terrorist projects. One has to realize, this is the final word, the final uh, thing, point I want to make, is that the uh, international jihadist groups use local insurgencies to advance their own global agenda. Mm -hmm. And local insurgencies are using these the, 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 the global jihadists to, to, uh, to advance their own local agendas. So that the cooperation between them and something very organic, we'll see what happens in Afghanistan. Thank you very much. I will stop here. Back to you. What the Taliban has shown is that they have what I would call strategic patience. They have resilience. They can emerge out of defeat 20 years ago, continue to fight an insurgency and ultimately succeed. And I believe that this has been one of the great weakness, not just of uh, US, but of NATO, to understand that. When I was in theater, I remember well, one of our most senior generals, British generals, whom I had served, outstanding. Uh, he was parachuted into Afghanistan with General Petraeus to use the tribal aspect that was done in Iraq as a way in which they could defeat a Taliban insurgency. He went to the Pentagon and gave a lecture in which he said, these Taliban, what are they? They have this dirty white garment, a dirty AK-47. We will wipe the floor with them. He could not understand Pashtun tribal culture and this concept of strategic patience and resilience that can keep fighting against all the odds. I think furthermore, what Taliban has shown is strategic thinking, planning, and policy in a way in which the US and NATO could not comprehend. In many senses, what has happened in Afghanistan today must be laid, laid at the doorstep of the US and her allies. Let me just illustrate this. If you take the US allies in the Gulf, 
let's take Qatar, which is very significant for NATO, for America, UK, Australia, and others, because we have our major base there. Qatar gave legitimacy to the Taliban, not just to house them, but projected them into, onto the international sea. And so there was a legitimacy which they did not have. Let's take the Gulf states. Ka uh, Taliban needed weapons. They needed money. The flow of money to the Gulf states and then the weapons that came back via Pakistan. We all knew that. When I was there, we had crates of money being shipped out of Kabul airport to the Gulf states, and it was accepted. Then we come to the role of Pakistan. The Pakistan military and its intelligence service, ISI, is an industry in itself. The Taliban leaders were hosted in Pakistan. Their soldiers, their fighters, uh, were often went there for recruitment or for uh, uh, health reasons. And it was known that, that Pakistan was involved in this whole area. I remember a major battle in which I was involved with as the advisor both for the Afghan forces and for NATO forces. The evening before the battle, I asked the uh, uh, Afghan brigadier, do you think Taliban knows that we're coming? He says, in cryptic words, of course. And where would they go? The next day we attacked, they weren't there because they crossed the border. And so this ability to use Pakistan as a springboard as to retreat and a springboard was known. We all knew it. We had the, uh, the, uh, uh, the signals, the, the intelligence, but NATO chose to do absolutely nothing about this. We allowed a state of affairs to develop. We allowed our very allies in the region to, to be used in such a way as to give, uh, uh, let's just say, to, to strengthen uh, Taliban. Take the issue of finance and taxation. Taliban was able to create an alternative financial system in the country by indirect taxation. And this was known. Again, when I was in Kandahar, every lorry that entered the base had to pay uh, 1,500 US dollars. I think it was $15 billion that were paid out. And, and we knew. And yet we accepted it as normal. Those who benefited were the foreign contractors who used US aid and all the other money for themselves, <clears throat> those policymakers and others in the US, and some Afghan leaders. So when we think of corruption, apart from strategic thinking, I think it is wrong to lay the blame wholly on the Afghan government and the failure on the Afghan National Army. I think this is very, very wrong. I think the US and her allies, including the UK, must put their hands up and plead guilty. I'm speaking from personal experience. I think of a colonel in one of the Kandak battalions. I was asked to go and sit with him, meet with him and discuss policy. He was a very unhappy person. He says, I have nothing to offer my guests but potatoes. The insurgents out there are living very, very well because effectively NATO is feeding them. I can't feed my guests and I can't feed my own men. And the issue of the payment of soldiers, for example, I remember there was a big issue of a banking structure and enabling soldiers in a battlefield situation to know that their money would be coming in so that they could feed their families. I think what 
my experience and what I think we see now, like many of us who are very, very unhappy, is, is the fundamental failure of a nation and not just a nation, a group of nations bringing into being ISAF, NATO, and believing that they can transform a country, something which has not been done before, the graveyard of empires. It is known that you can conquer Afghanistan, you cannot hold Afghanistan. And to impose a Western system of democracy, of civil order organizations, it is not possible in a culture rooted in history, rooted in its own customary laws, its own sense of honor and shame. And I think if one lesson can now be learned is that the US and NATO, and think particularly of my own country, UK, must have humility. And they must recognize that their exponents don't know as much as they claim to know. Their policy makers are not very good. And their military may be good for fixed generation warfare, but when it comes to stabilization, to fighting an insurgency for an irregular warfare, they are not suitable for it. And ultimately, the strategic patience of an insurgency group will win. Now, the problem that we have is now that many insurgency groups around the world know this. They have seen the strategic failure of the US and now they begin to think they have a chance of success. Many now look at the issue of trust. Can the US be trusted? Can Britain be trusted? The answer is no, because they will be used and then discarded. And so why become involved with the US? Why work for her? Why be engaged if you know at the end she is not as great as she thinks she is, she can lose. And more than anything else, she will betray you. And this issue will impact heavily as we think of global insurgencies that are now developing using as uh, his Excellency Ali Jamali has said that the localized can impact on the international and the international can impact on the local. And the insurgency movements that are developing across Africa, across some parts of Southeast Asia and South Asia is now going to be affected by what has happened in the in Afghanistan. Of course, there are those who say, well, these insurgent groups will fight against each other. There'll be Sunni versus Shia, uh, Al-Qaeda versus Islamic State versus Taliban. I think this shows a lack of understanding of a much, much deeper issue of what culture means for a people, for nations, for tribes that are religious-based and honor-based and how they see the US and the UK, not as a friend, but ultimately as an enemy and one that they can never trust. Hi, Rothstein, you quite some time ago predicted this outcome and this failure in Afghanistan. Can you now predict the consequences of the strategic consequences of this failure? You know, I guess, uh... I think it was Yogi Berra that said, you know, trying to make predictions uh, is very difficult, especially if you're talking about the future. Um, so the answer is no. Uh, but as uh, both of your guests have said, what's happened is not good for the United States. Most importantly, it's not good for the people uh, in Afghanistan. Uh, let me just start by uh, by saying, first of all, it's 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 really a pleasure to appear on this. Uh, in this forum with uh, with with you gentlemen, so uh, thank you for the opportunity. And and my comments are going to be both mostly based on um, my frustration with um, how the United States uh, has uh, has engaged in Afghanistan over the 
almost last 20 years. And to paraphrase, uh, you know, Winston Churchill, uh, I think we can say that for the United States, at least from my perspective, this is our most shameful hour. Um, we hear on the news and in, re read in the newspaper, current and former political, military and intelligence officials uh, trying to pin the responsibility for this devastating outcome on everybody, you know, but themselves. I heard uh, one former NATO commander, you know, say that uh, we should have built the Afghan security forces uh, more like the Taliban. People are saying this was inevitable. Uh, even the president uh, most recently blamed the Afghans themselves for what has transpired as well as his uh, predecessor. To me, these statements are just infuriating. If these people knew that what has unfolded over the last few days was inevitable, why didn't they reassess and adjust policy and strategy uh, accordingly? Uh, if they knew what was going to happen and they didn't make these adjustments, you know, I think they're criminally negligent for sacrificing the, sacrificing the lives of thousands of people over the last 20 years. And if they were unaware that U.S. policy uh, and strategy uh, were not working, then they're just plain incompetent. You know, those are really the two uh, choices uh, for all of the people in senior positions uh, that were involved. So the fall of Afghanistan, uh, from my perspective, and I think both of uh, my colleagues on this program uh, have said the same in different ways, but the fall, more than anything else, I think is the result of U.S. Uh, political and military arrogance and incompetence at the senior levels over the last 20 years. And statements trying to attribute to the, to the, the disaster to Afghan corruption or their lack of will to fight or that a political solution was the only way that peace can be brought to Afghanistan, I think are all smoke screens. And the Biden's, uh, Biden administration's claim that the outcome would have been the same uh, regardless uh, of how long, remain, how long we remained in Afghanistan, or the choice was simply between fighting the Afghans' civil war or ending U.S. involvement, I think is also nonsense and a false choice. Uh, Afghanistan could have been a success story. So the failure, and I've, and, and I've talked about this uh, before on, uh, on, in this forum, but the, the, the failure really is a result of a fundamental design flaw uh, in U.S.-Afghan policy that shaped the way the government in Kabul uh, is or was. Uh, and the idea of imposing you know, strong centralized authority in a country like Afghanistan actually generated the insurgency you know, against, uh, its, against the country. Uh, and the presence of security forces in the countryside that were non-locals um, uh, were viewed as defenders of the central government and not defenders uh, of the local population. So this policy of centralization really left the Afghan countryside, where almost 75% of the population uh, lives, unprotected from the Taliban. But the United States fell into the pattern in insisting uh, on insisting that contrary to the way Afghanistan has run in the past, you know, we're going to, we were going to impose a type of government and a type of security force that was really alien to the way things work in that country. So the American formula that was forced on the Afghans was never a, a formula for security. Uh, it was really the cause of instability uh, and the growth and strength of the insurgency. Uh, this is why, you know, all of the money and resources that the United States poured into the country never thwarted uh, the Taliban. Now, I think we knew this. I mean, it didn't take long to see the evidence that the U.S. approach uh, was not working. But rather than adjusting uh, the approach, every administration either ignored uh, the evidence or chose to reinforce failure. The U.S. military 
of continue to rotate units into that country as if Afghanistan was an extension of the military's national uh, training centers. And then, you know, just inexplicably, winning was eliminated from the American political military list of acceptable terms. Uh, and leaders started focusing on how do we get out of that country with some semblance you know, of honor. And this created a very bizarre, bizarre situation um, under the Trump administration. The United States was talking directly with the Taliban, the enemy uh, we sought to remove from power almost 20 years ago. Uh, and the Afghan government, a government that we helped create, was a government of our creation, was excluded from the negotiations because the Taliban demanded it. And to make things worse, the United States pressed the Afghan government to release thousands of Taliban and Al-Qaeda prisoners as a gesture of good faith. American leaders seem to be oblivious to their culpability uh, in the deteriorating situation uh, and in undermining the will of the Afghan security forces. Uh, if there is such a thing as a diplomatic do not do checklist, the United States violated every element on that list. Uh, and as a result, the Americans, you know, reinforce the Taliban's claim that the Afghan government is nothing more than a puppet regime. All of this, in my estimation, dishonors the sacrifice that Americans and Afghans have made who fought for decades to try to create a better country in, Af in Afghanistan. And the Biden administration gave the Taliban the final green light in its announcement of unconditional, of an unconditional exit and the elimination of all meaningful combat support. And they did this with enough time for the Taliban to take action to make the 20th anniversary of 9-11 of an important celebration you know, for them. So while this failure is not an orphan, President Biden's assertion uh, that under his leadership, the United States is back at the head of the table really rings hollow. I think his actions have made allies feel that the United States cannot be trusted and it has given our enemies reason not to fear us. But also, uh, I think a signal that this administration really does not care about the lives and futures of other people. So the United States will be lucky to get a seat at the table and uh, it would be very justifiable if the United States is not even invited to the next big meeting at all. Could the speakers address the question of the strategic consequences of this failure, perhaps not just for the United States, which you have already alluded to, but let's start with Central Asia. What does this mean for the country's contiguous uh, to Afghanistan. Ali Jalali, is this just a, a victory for Pakistan and the ISI, or do they have worries in the long run for what success means uh, for the Taliban in Afghanistan? Uh, and what about uh, China and, and Russia or the Central Asian nations and Iran? Well, uh, thank you. I think this is a very uh, good uh, question, good topics to uh, discuss. I think in the uh, uh, coming weeks and months, I think this will be discussed at uh, different uh, uh, forums and also think tanks. First take Pakistan. Pakistan is, uh, of course, is uh, happy that uh, the Taliban, that they have uh, supported for a long time and they have influence over them uh, and uh, they have leverage over them as uh, finally uh, in charge in Afghanistan. But on the other hand, they should also realize that the uh, victory of the Taliban, which in many countries, including Russia, the UN, uh, Europe, still on the books as terrorist organization, this can galvanize other jihadists in the region. They galvanize the, uh, the, the the uh, TTP, the, the, the Pakistani Taliban, the other uh, extremist group with Taliban. And uh, 
Taliban has known that for many years they wanted uh, the Taliban to be uh, to use as to create a strategic depth in Afghanistan uh, in their confrontation with India. But now there are there also a possibility that Pakistan could become a, 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 a strategic depth for the Taliban for the extremists. Well, I don't know how Pakistan sees it, but this is some uh, possibility. On the other hand, Central Asia, the thinking in Central Asia has always been influenced by Russia. Russia for a while was uh, 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 spreading the sphere of the instability in Afghanistan that will spill over to, uh, to the Central Asia. And therefore, they, 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 uh, the Russia is the only country in that region to, to help them. And I think in the, in the past few weeks when the Taliban actually made inroads in the North, uh, the uh, Russia is uh, supported and reinforced the uh, border uh, uh, forces of Tajikistan which has 1,500 kilometers uh, uh, the uh, border with, Afgh with, with Afghanistan, and also uh, the, uh, the Collective Security Treaty Organization, where some of these uh, Central Asian countries are part of it with Russia. They also met in uh, Russia, uh, you know, promised that they will he uh, meet them. On the other hand, Russia is the only country that is, is uh, uh, making uh, some kind of uh, positive statements about the, the, the uh, uh, Taliban's takeover in Afghanistan. So uh, the Russia has been changing all over from the time that uh, US intervention in Afghanistan, they supported them. Later on, they were happy that they wanted to let the, the US bleed in Afghanistan. And later on, they, they took uh, after the withdrawal of uh, forces in the uh, transition, they became active to use it uh, for their benefit in Central Asia and in Afghanistan. Now, one reason that the Afghan security forces became demoralized was the recent support from Russia to the Taliban and support of Iran, Russia, China, and Pakistan to the Taliban. So I don't know what will happen. If the Central Asia believes that uh, Russia can uh, save them if the situation deteriorates in Afghanistan further, they should realize that in Badakhshan, northeastern province of Afghanistan, Many of the Taliban are Central Asians. They are from Tajikistan, the Ansarullah. And one of the people that we know from the past that he was part of the uh, Tajik uh, uh, extremists is in charge of security in, in, in some uh, districts bordering Tajikistan. The same way the, 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 uh, the Islamic movement of Tajikistan, of Uzbekistan, were working together with, with, with Taliban in India. So they have to be you know, aware of these uh, the development. It all depends what happens inside Afghanistan. If the Taliban, the way they say, is something that they, they, they seriously are committed to, maybe that will improve the situation to some extent. If they say they are not going to allow anybody to use Afghanistan uh, territory against another country, but can they do that? Uh, can their internal uh, structure such that they can come up with a unified policy or not? Can they control all the ungoverned spaces in Afghanistan or not? So uh, as I said earlier, I think uh, the global uh, jihadist groups are going to use this situation in Afghanistan to, uh, you know, to, to uh, uh, boost their uh, recruitment operation, recruitment operations in propaganda and uh, information warfare. That's what, uh, the, but we will see situation may change in the next uh, few months, but uh, still that threat, that situation is still there. Dr. Sudeo, would you care to comment? Yes, I just have a few thoughts to share. Uh, Dr. Rothstein has spoken of the failure of centralization. Uh, what may well happen is that given the full strength of Taliban as such, maybe 70, 75,000 fighters, they will be unable to hold the whole of Afghanistan and the ungovernable uh, spaces may well drift back 
under local rule of warlords, local autonomous groups, etc., which will not be able to be controlled by a strong center because that strong center may not be there. And at that point, we may well see emerging elements which uh, could cause us difficulties in the future. And those elements could be linked to outside elements. I think that would be the first. The second is the Russian Ministry of Defense recently issued a report on Taliban's linkage to Turkmenistan and to Taliban uh, fighters being seen in the capital and others. So I think what we already are seeing is that an extension of Taliban into certain Central Asian contexts and with some governments uh, trying to shut, close their borders. But I don't think that is possible. I think the real, I think Russia will be in a very difficult position. On the one hand, they are conscious of terrorism right on their doorstep because of the experience of Chechens and others. I remember Chechens had a very significant role in Afghanistan. So they're going to want to neutralize terrorism at the same time, because they are at the center of a security architecture for Central Asia, they're going to have to, let's just say, adjust policies uh, to ensure that extremists do not move into an Afghan context, which may well mean accepting elements which they are not happy with. And they're going to be pragmatic, I believe, and play both sides of the game. When we come to Pakistan, I think Pakistan's principal problem has always been the Durand line and the divide between what is technically Afghanistan and technically Pashtun land uh, in, in Pakistan. And so Pakistan is driven by the fear of an internal collapse because Pakistan is not a unity whether it be the Baluch, whether it be the Punjabis, the Pashtun, uh, they all want some kind of, of governance. The Punjabis, of course, are the key players in all of this. And so the, is the dilemma facing any Pakistani government is if they take a hard line in Afghanistan, this could come back to bite them in Pakistan. So it is better to see a Taliban in place in Afghanistan, which they can then uh, relate to, and then be the mouthpiece of internationally by actually positioning themselves as the great, uh, uh, let's just say, player on the world stage to represent interests uh, all around the, the, that area. And I think that is what may well emerge to contain their own uh, dissidents uh, within Pakistan itself. And I think that ethnic issue has not been properly understood in America and the West. They see it purely as Taliban uh, being played off by ISI or being used by ISI and the military. I think when we come to China, China, of course, great fear is Xinjiang and a potential insurgency there, which could be fueled by Taliban in Afghanistan. And so I think what Russia uh, is beginning to do is to say, look, we're not interested in the internal affairs of Afghanistan. We've never been there. We've never been a nation that has sought control of others, but what we want are good relations and we want economics. Now, I remember the 10 billion dollar deal which the, the Chinese struck uh, with the Afghan government for copper. And I think given the vast mineral resources, particularly lithium and others, China will be looking at an economic engagement within Afghanistan. Now, Chinese policy has been based on, in terms of the Muslim world, internal and external. Internal dominance of Han, which means suppression of a Xinjiang identity, external 
to bolster every group there for, on an economic basis. If she uses that same approach, which is used in Pakistan, Turkey, and elsewhere, then Taliban may not pose such a threat as we would expect it to do. So I don't think we really know what is going to happen. We, we don't know how it is going to be played out. I think we are in very, very uncertain times, but I think we have to look at every option and that's going to require a totally different kind of analyst to interpret those kinds of trends and events. Dr. Rothstein. Yeah, I think uh, the first thing is our enemies, uh, China, uh, Russia, Iran, are related in, in, the, uh, in the outcome of, of events uh, in Afghanistan. Uh, the Indians, uh, not so much so because uh, their influence and their investments in Afghanistan uh, will probably go up in smoke right now because Pakistan will probably insist on that which means tensions between India and Pakistan uh, may uh, uh, intensify. Um, as uh, Patrick mentioned, uh, both the Russians and the Chinese have their own issues with, uh, uh, with uh, Muslims and Islamist extremism. And at some point, you know, the Taliban is gonna have to reconcile any relations they have with those countries uh, with how those countries treat their own Muslim populations. Um, so that could be a potential, you know, hotspot uh, also. Um, and again, who knows uh, how uh, what has transpired will affect uh, Pakistan. Pakistan itself has had problems in the past with extremist, uh, uh, their own extremist Taliban uh, elements, and they dealt with that fairly ruthlessly uh, in the past. So the Afghan Taliban uh, has been acceptable to uh, uh, Pakistan in the past, but not any uh, radical Taliban elements that operate uh, in their own uh, you know, tribal areas. So I think the consensus is we don't know uh, how th things are going to work out, but I think there are some a lot of potential areas where tensions in the region can increase dramatically, which, which would, would result in ungoverned spaces that possibly could foment terrorism against the United States and our allies. What can we say about uh, Iran's interest? Uh, they have always seen themselves as um, protectors of the sizable Shia population, uh, of the Hazaras up in the Mazari Sharif area, um, do we can we expect the Taliban to respect Iran's uh, interest in that way, or will they revert to the uh, the way they behaved before, which is a Sunni uh, suppression of the Shia there? I have discussed this in my articles, which is published this month in the uh, Middle East Journal, the geopolitics of the Iran-Afghanistan relations. The relationship of Iran with Afghanistan had always been uh, underpinned by its geopolitical uh, interest, but uh, the policy of Iran has never been devoid of ideological and nationalistic uh, trends either. So uh, Iran has uh, followed a civil track uh, policy in Afghanistan. On the one hand, it uh, reached out to the Afghan government, supported the government uh, for uh, in reconstruction projects, and uh, at the same time, uh, security along the border in order to stem the flow of uh, narcotics. But at the same time, it reached out to uh, minority groups like uh, Hazaras and Shias that you, they, uh, they created, they, they subsidized uh, the educational institutions, religious, uh, uh, religious organizations, media, and also even uh, used money to influence uh, elections and other uh, uh, activities in Afghanistan. Now, all this was, do, was being done to offset the influence of the United States 
and any threats that from uh, the uh, from the presence of the U.S. will be uh, the uh, will uh, uh, actually uh, come to the Iran from Afghanistan. At the same time, uh, the, uh, Iran uh, established calibrated relationship with Taliban, not because ideologically they they uh, see eye to eye, because to use them as an offset against the United States presence there. Now, uh, historically, Iran has been doing this. He, the Iran is being this in the Middle East, the uh, with proxies, and then uh, during the uh, uh, war with uh, with Iraq, they created uh, the, uh, the, the militia from the Afghans, the Shias, uh, the, 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 uh, uh, that they were used against Iraq. And then later on in Syria, they created the Fatimian division of the Shias of uh, Afghans and in, 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 uh, uh, in Iran, uh, who, were, who fought in, in Syria, numbering from 10,000 to 20,000. Some of them returned to Afghanistan. And although after the, the war of the, with ISIS, they claimed that they have dismantled it, but they maintained some of it. Iranian uh, the foreign minister openly said a few months back that these Fatimiyun militias can be used in Afghanistan against ISIS or the Daesh. And there is a, a, a threat at the same time, Iran also helped some of the small armed militias inside Afghanistan, central Afghanistan. But now what is going to happen? The uh, Taliban so far showed that they are accommodating to Shias and Hazaras. Even now is the holy month of uh, Muharram, uh, that the Shias are uh, celebrated in, in special ways. And Taliban went to uh, sympathize with them, even help them to uh, do this. They also even went to uh, some Hazara areas to tell them that they have nothing to do with Hazaras. Although in their, uh, their rule in 1990s, they massacred Hazaras. Now, is this, uh, as I said earlier, is this, uh, does this mean that they have changed, which I, I, I doubt it, or it is just a kind of a uh, propaganda or a kind of a uh, strategic uh, ploys to win the support of the international community. When the Taliban established themselves in Afghanistan, then the Iran probably will be looking at the regional competition, probably with Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia is one of the countries that was also involved in Afghanistan in the past 40 years. And in some cases, they would compete with Iran. And, uh, but now, uh, Iran has in a better position geographically. It's next door, same language, same culture. And uh, Saudi Arabia is far away it, it's uh, intervention in Afghanistan in seasonal. So uh, at the same time, the, uh, the uh, Iran will be looking for any regional competition. And also Iran is now very much interested in this market in Afghanistan. The, currently, the trade of Afghanistan, the majority of trade is done with Iran. Iran has uh, actually dominated the markets in Afghanistan. In the past, it was Pakistan and China, now it's Iran. Uh, so therefore, Iran will be interested to uh, get involved in Afghanistan and, and also confront any competition that can come from Pakistan or Saudi Arabia or the United Arab Emirates. Hi, do you have any uh, comments on? Yeah, I was going to, um, Ali Jalali really has the expertise in this, but uh, from what I've been able to observe over the years, uh, along the border between Afghanistan and Iran. Uh, they've made accommodations for generations and trade with one another and uh, uh, and seem to have, uh, again, a, a relationship based on accommodation that has endured for a long time, even when, when the Taliban was running the country uh, a long time ago, and I suspect it'll be the same today. So yeah, th there's gonna be ideological differences, but I think, uh, um, there is a, a practical reason to have uh, cordial relationships uh, with the people that live in that border area. 
uh, and that will be consistent with what I think has transpired in the past. I would support both of what uh, the two speakers have said. <clears throat> I would only add the following that I believe that national interest comes first, followed by regional interest, and then navigating the ideological differences. And for Iran, her great issue at the moment has to do with uh, Israel and the US. Given that, she is going to be looking at the regional interest of uh, Afghanistan. Is she going to want to pick a fight with Afghanistan? Is Taliban going to pick a fight with her? I doubt it. I think what we see in Pakistan, with Pakistan's national self-interest coming first in terms of Afghanistan, may well be played out in Iran as she considers her self-interest and her need to have friends, allies, and, and others. And I think that may well mean that ideological differences, although they are there and they're acute, may well take a backstage position, a secondary position in favor of what is ahead. And I think this is where the US is going to be in a very, very uh, real dilemma because with the loss of Afghanistan, the sense of failure and shame, how is she going to deal with Iran? There are those who will say, take an even harder line so you don't fail again. With Taliban and Afghanistan, withhold the seven and a half billion that are currently in the US banks and uh, starve her to death with, with much greater sanctions. So is she going to take a harder position? Is Mr. Biden going to redeem himself by coming out now as the great fighter? Or are they going to have that ability to step back and not react as the US did, I think in 9-11, without giving much thought to what to do they engage in a re reaction which has led us where we are. The danger is now such a reaction. I think the US will need to look at both Iran and Afghanistan from a different perspective and not to be seen as the cruel victimizers full of vengeance and really wants just to destroy. I, I'm very, very concerned that the US now do not overreact and Mr. Biden suddenly becomes the ultra strong person. There have been several references to the internal situation of, of Afghanistan, but there are ungoverned spaces uh, that the Taliban forces only number some 70,000. Uh, does that create an opportunity for any opposition groups that remain uh, to uh, mount an armed struggle against the Taliban, or are they too demoralized to the point uh, that there will be no opposition and the Taliban will be allowed to consolidate its complete control of the country? I'm not sure who would support um, such a potential uh, insurgency at this point. Um, I can, cannot imagine the United States trying to do so, nor can I imagine uh, any of our allies trying to uh, support the resistance movement uh, in that country uh, now. Um, so I think the likelihood of, uh, of an insurrection uh, is, is fairly low. Now, when you mentioned ungoverned spaces, um, Afghanistan, again, and, and, and you know, from my uh, you know, reading, and again, Ali Jalali can probably set some, set, shed some light on this, but um, when we talk about ungoverned spaces, we're really s saying not governed from Kabul, but that doesn't mean that they're ungoverned. They're normally governed pretty well. Yeah. And whether or not the local people and local government um, and local security forces in those areas uh, accept um, um, 
Al Qaeda or ISIS or whatever, uh, really remains to be seen. Uh, you know, they're not particularly uh, inclined, I think, to uh, accept outsiders like Al Qaeda uh, to begin <clears> with. So <throat> those areas may be very well governed locally and quite secure locally, and not a threat uh, to uh, uh, to the West. You know, uh, it all depends on what uh, transpires in Afghanistan. You know, in 1990s, three factors helped the Taliban to uh, win the support of the people very quickly. In a matter of two or three years, they were able to control 90% of the Afghan territory. The reason was first, <clears throat> they promised that they will uh, end the end fighting of the Mujahideen groups that they were fighting in each city and even in streets, every street of the cities. And the second to disarm the militias that they were creating uh, uh, insecurity for the people. And third, to unify the country. These were things that people liked it after the, the civil war in Afghanistan, after the withdrawal of the Soviet Union. And that's helped them. Three other factors actually contributed to their downfall. First, their uh, hard line and harsh interpretation of the Sharia for the uh, Afghan people who were unfamiliar with it, uh, and uh, the uh, suffering that people had uh, experienced because of this. Uh, second was the, uh, their discrimination against certain ethnic groups, Hazaras, Shias, Tajiks, which is uh, in Afghanistan, traditionally, they are all left uh, co in, uh, in peaceful coexistence. Uh, uh, they actually crossed that line. The third was they brought the foreigners, the Pakistanis, the jihadis, the Al-Qaeda's. And when the United States intervened, the, the whole machinery of Taliban collapsed in two months because people, many people didn't want them. The, uh, the, bomb, the B-52 helped them to, to, to make it happen. Now, again, if Taliban, as they say, that they are changed, probably that for the situation will be different. If not, you will see that the resistance will start coming. You have today in, in uh, three promises of Afghanistan, in Nangrahar, in Khost, in Kunar, when Taliban raised their flag, and brought down the national flag of Afghanistan everywhere, there was a major demonstration on the country provinces. They raised the national flag of Afghanistan and brought down the flag of Taliban. And they reacted Taliban, uh, and some clashes took place in Jalalabad. One person was killed, and uh, there was uh, a writer says three people were killed. This is going to continue that kind of uh, reaction. The women yesterday actually came out and said, we are here, still here. If you believe that it's 1990s, it's not. Then uh, in Panjshir, which is not under Taliban control yet, the first vice president of Ghani, uh, said that Ghani is gone now. According to the Afghan constitution, I am the president now of Afghanistan. And he invited all the uh, soldiers to uh, stop fighting to come to Panjshir, they are opening a new front against the Taliban, they say. Well, these actions may be at the beginning now, not very strong, but if the Taliban behavior continues, oppression continues, and their, their, their policies later on when they establish themselves become very suppressive, then you will see that that, that, that kind of resistance come up. This is in the, the, the blood of Afghans. When that takes place, then regional actors will intervene. Iran will do the same thing as they did in Yemen, in Lebanon, and in Syria. They will revive the Fatimi Yun to, 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 to fight on their side. India will intervene, Pakistan too, probably the others. Then the situation will become something like what happened in 1990s. So uh, I don't know, I hope this does not happen, but this is the dynamics of, of uh, society in Afghanistan.
Uh, Ali, you, you expressed some uh, skepticism as to whether the Taliban has changed its stripes. Uh, if they haven't, uh, will they attempt to enforce as a severe an interpretation of the Sharia as they did before, which alienated so much of the population? Yeah. Particularly now, after 20 years, when the population has not been under that that kind of uh, legal rule. That skepticism is there. There are two things to look at it. First of all, uh, the from 1990s, many things have changed in the region and also in the minds of the people. This is a new generation of, of Taliban now. <clears throat> this is not a, only Mullah Umar Taliban. It is Mullah Ghani Brothers Taliban now. Many are young, they were exposed to uh, modernity in this, in, in the, during these uh, years in the Middle East, in Qatar, in Dubai. Uh, and uh, for one thing, <clears throat> in 1990s, they were against uh, technology, against TV, and uh, even they were not uh, banned uh, taking pictures. Today there is all social media and also <laughs> all the electronic media to, uh, to, uh, to, to express themselves. Yesterday, the Tolo News, a TV, a private TV uh, in Afghanistan, had an interview. The Taliban spokesman was, uh, was interviewed by the women journalist of the country. Something unprecedented, something was not. So is it, is it, uh, does it mean a change? Maybe not a change, but whether this will translate into uh, uh, action when they establish it or not. On the other hand, Taliban also, they, they do not deny that their ideology is changed. They say ideology or the, the Islamic, uh, the, you know, uh, character of the, of, the, of the state was still the same, but the implementation might be different. So uh, we don't know. I think the, uh, it is too early to uh, take the Taliban by their words and to believe what they say. I think that will, it will take time to see what's happening. On the other hand, Afghanistan society has changed. The resistance against that kind of uh, suppressive action that was in 1990 is uh, quite, quite possible. So, uh, I think we have to put all these two together and see what's going to happen. Thank you. Dr. Sukail. I'd like to and, and thanks uh, Ali so much for what he said, which I, I fully support. I just wanted to make a comment on uh, Taliban's understanding of Sharia based on their Diobandi interpretation. I listened to one of their senior leaders yesterday who put forward a very interesting proposition. He said, we know that we have killed many people and that we did wrong. And we're asking for forgiveness, that you forgive us. Now, intriguingly enough, in the Obandi Sharia theology, that is an issue. There are two key principles. One is that if you're going to develop an ethical framework, you must first look at the consequences. And only <coughs> after you have understood the consequences or arrived at that, can you define the ethical framework. And the second arises out of that in terms of action and is separated between what is permissible and what is honorable. So if what is permissible is someone has killed my brother, it is permissible for me in Pashtunwali tribal culture to kill him, that is not the honorable thing to do. The honorable thing to do would be to forgive him because of the potential consequences. So listening to the Taliban leaders yesterday, what struck me, what they had actually traversed into that uh, the Obandi theological position, which is very much 
in Catholic theology, Aquinas. It's remarkable, the similarity, which leads me to wonder whether there are now new thinkers within Taliban that are more theologically versed, particularly in their extreme interpretation of a Diobandi theology, but is willing to enter that pragmatic area where they're separating customary law with Sharia law. Now, if that be the case, then I think there is a very, very slight possibility of hope for a change because they may well be saying to their fighters, do not practice revenge, forgive. And they're saying to others, please forgive us because we're going to have to find a way together. And I think we need to remember that Taliban fighters have mothers, they have sisters, they have families, they have communities. And many of them will want to go back home and build their lives. I know that seems pie in the sky at this time, but they're also human beings. And I think somehow we have to find a way of allowing space. Now, do I trust them? The answer is no. Do I believe that there's an inherent change? That may not be the case. Only time will tell. But I was impressed yesterday by this discussion on forgiveness, which goes into the Abandi theology and in terms of ethics. That gives me a very, very small degree of hope. Well, the Tolo TV is still operating is uh, interesting in and of itself. Yeah, yes, uh, it, is, it is operating, yeah. The remaining U.S. interest in Afghanistan is that it not become a base for terrorist action. And the Taliban gave the United States a pledge that it would actually fight uh, the Islamic State in Afghanistan. <laughs> yeah. on, the, on the other hand, there, there are reports that when they let the prisoners out of the Bagram Air Base prison, it included releasing yeah. ISIS members. Yes. So what, all right, Ali, first you, do you, do you think they'll hold that pledge or they're going to? I think, <laughs> yeah, I think if they are looking for international recognition and uh, outside support, which Afghanistan need that, uh, I think they will uh, try to uh, confront or not allow uh, church organizations to uh, uh, use Afghanistan territory against uh, the uh, U.S. interests because they know very well that the United States still has uh, over the horizon capacity to attack them. And then in that case, there will be sanctions. And uh, is it worth it for them to do that? Therefore, maybe they will be encouraged to do that if they're looking for it. I don't think they are so much ideologically based you know, organization anymore to sacrifice everything just for an ideology. Yeah. So I believe that there is a possibility that they will fight the ISIS there in Afghanistan. Thank you, Ali. Thank you. Thank you. Can I say, I, I agree with what Ali is saying. Conflicts are already emerging between ISIS, Taliban, and AQ. And uh, it may well be that at some point they may unite. But at this moment in time, given Taliban's accord with the US and statements concerning insurgencies, particularly ISIS, this has annoyed uh, ISIS very much with Taliban. Now, those prisoners have been released. It would be difficult to detain them. The question is what happens with those prisoners? Where do they go? Who are they going to be allied with? So I think in the short term, Taliban will be thinking pragmatically. Again, to give an illustration from yesterday, the press conference behind the speakers was a, a painting of people that historically, the Taliban would have destroyed all pictures of people, yet they did a press conference with that. Now that could be they're presenting a soft face, but it could be that ideology is beginning to take a second place. 
And uh, the first point is going to be them establishing a stake, getting some kind of economic uh, policy going, unifying a nation and finding a way forward. I would not dismiss those areas. And perhaps uh, uh, Professor Ali, Your Excellency, given your position, is whether it is possible to influence that direction. I know that will be very, very difficult to do, but it may well be that breathing space could allow for hope for the future. I think uh, as the uh, uh, European Union uh, said today that even if they do not recognize Taliban government as a legitimate government, they will continue to engage them in order to, uh, you know, protect the uh, rights of people and also to uh, kind of moderate their policies. Mm -hmm. So this can continue, but, uh, but if, if they are not recognized that they are as a as legitimate government, they cannot hope that they will be helped. They will be, or the sanction, United uh, Nations sanction will be lifted. They will, I think for the time being, I think they will try every everything in order to get uh, you know, the sanctions lifted and they get some support from the international community. Hi, any uh, closing thoughts before we sign off here? Um, you know, my experience in Afghanistan and with dealing with Afghans is uh, they're probably the most practical people that I've ever met uh, anywhere in the world. And the Taliban, uh, Pashtuns are, there's also a practical nature, you know, to them. And the reason why they uh, fell so quickly in 2001 and 2002 is they lost the practical nature of what it is to be uh, an Afghan. I, I'm, I'm hoping they don't make that mistake again. So I suspect they will be practical enough to survive in the international community. Uh, but I don't see them as uh, uh, in any type of liberal order in the future. Uh, hopefully, again, the changed society that um, that you both spoke about will force the Taliban to uh, um, accept uh, the nature of that change, especially among, you know, a very high percentage of the Afghans who are very young right now and who have grown up under some degree of freedom. Um, again, if they're practical, they'll accept that and go with it. I would just make a very quick comment on sanctions in the US. I would hope that the US do not apply a blanket approach to sanctions. If she can release, for example, the seven and a half billion, but somehow find a way in which that money could go to assist the people of Afghanistan, education, particularly food, health, and others and not be diverted into military, if that is possible. I think if the US goes for a blanket approach to sanctions as she has done in Iran, for example, this will only hurt the ordinary person who will be extremely vulnerable because if you look at the GDP and the income, it was dependent very much on, on the US. If they are hurt, this will only increase radicalization and hatred for the US. So I think that would be my closing comment that somehow the US will have to navigate the economic issues that support the peoples of Afghanistan and not a military architecture of Taliban. Well, thank you very much. I'm afraid we're out of time. I want to thank our three speakers, Ambassador Ali Jalali, Dr. Patrick Sukdeo, the chairman of the Westminster Institute, and Dr. Hai Rothstein for joining us today to discuss the strategic consequences of the failure in Afghanistan. I invite our viewers and listeners to go to the Westminster Institute website online to find our other uh, videos on our YouTube channel discussing not only Afghanistan, but Russia, China, and other urgent contemporary national security and geostrategic issues. Thank you for joining us. I'm Bob Riley, your host.